Or can he think to be saved when they shall be sentenced, who with so much deliberation and despite have done this thing? Oh, let us consider the after-reckoning, and let us not with pretenses distinguish ourselves into a defection, or distract ourselves into the oblivion of this, that God is righteous to whom the reckoning must be made. Number two. Let it be supposed, under Saul's tyranny, when the Ziphims informed him of David's hiding himself with them, or when Doeg informed him of Amalek's resetting him, that an order had been given forth to all Israel with this narrative, whereas that rebel David had now openly despised authority, had been entertained by the priest, received Goliath's sword from him, and gathered a company of armed men together. Therefore, to the end, he was... Uh, he and his accomplices, excuse me, may be brought to justice. We ordain all from Dan to Beersheba to concur either personally in this expedition against him or to pay cess to our standing forces to maintain them in this ex expedition, or so much to gratify the Ziphims for their ki uh, kindness, or to furnish Doeg with a sword to murder the priests of the Lord. Would any that favored David's righteous cause have dared to do any of these? Would these that durst not concur themselves contribute any encouragement to the concurrers? Would Saul's servants, that would not fall upon the priests of the Lord themselves, have given Doeg one of their swords to do it, or money to buy one, if, that, if it had been demanded? To the same purpose, suppose a party comes to a dissenter with an express order, and this narrative, whereas there is such a minister, met with some people at an execrable conventicle, as they call it, but in itself the pure worship of God, Therefore, to the end, the minister may be taken and murdered, and the servants of the Lord for the countenance they gave him may be brought to the same punishment. They ordain him for the accomplishment of their design, to furnish that party with all necessaries, or to pay such a sum of money for not concurring with them. Now, should he in this case not only forbear to lay down his life for his brethren, and forbear to deliver them that are thus drawn unto death on such an account, into which forbearance the great God will make so accurate an inquiry, Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12, as may make us tremble whether we, are, whether we look backward or forward, but also furnish according to the tenor of this order, that party of the dragon's legions in their war against the prince Michael and his angels, with supplies, and think to cut off excuse me, and think to put off the matter and plead innocent with this, that he was under the moral force of the law, accompanied with such military force, as if he had refused, they would have taken away all he had, etc. For this plea, in its full strength, is to do evil, that some good may come of it, no true good, which brings damnation, Romans 3, verse 8, or to choose sin rather than affliction. Thirdly, what if Manasseh, or other idolatrous princes that sacrificed to devils and made children pass through the fire of Molech had enacted a cess or under severe impositions of fines had commanded all to concur to a solemn sacrifice of that nature charging every man against a certain day to bring in his proportion in order to celebrate the sacrifice with all its statute solemnities or should have taken a child from every father and then made a law that each of these should contribute such a sum for furnishing with all necessaries and maintaining these murderers whom they had conduced to shed the blood of their innocent children or sacrifice them to Molech. Could it be expected that any of the godly would have paid such exactions and then have wiped his mouth with the notion of a moral force? This comes home enough to our case, for no sacrifice they can offer to the devil can be more real or so acceptable as what they declare they intend to do, being so direct not only in opposition to the coming of the kingdom of Christ, but the deletion of his precious interests and extirpation of his faithful remnant, and the giving Satan such an absolute dominion in the nation, as that they who have made the decree, and all who put it in execution, practically declare thereby they have emancipated themselves to his slavery, and sold themselves to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. So likewise that all the rest of the nation may with themselves become his vassals, and in evidence of their opposition to Christ, and in recognition of Satan's sovereignty and their subjection, they are appointed to pay these back meals. Fourthly, let it be supposed that after Nebuchadnezzar had made the decree for all to fall down and worship his image, and the three children were apprehended for refusing it, he had made another, and that all the Jews especially should contribute, every one a faggot or money to buy it, to heat the furnace, or a rope to, lead them, uh, to lead them to it, excuse me, can any man suppose that Daniel or the rest of the faithful would have paid it? Even so, let it be supposed 
that any one of these faithful ambassadors of Christ or all these zealous workers together with God who have labored among the people in the preached gospel should fall into the hand of these hunters and then they should make a law and appoint every man in the nation to send but one thread to make a tow to hang that minister or to hang the whole company of Christ's ambassadors and a farthing to pay the executioner. Can any man without horror think of complying so far as to contribute what is commanded? Or would not a gracious man, frightened into an abhorrence at the atrociousness of the wickedness, or fired into a flame for, of zeal for God, say without demur, as not daunted with fear of what flesh could do unto him, I will rather venture my all to keep them alive, or be hanged with them, than by doing what is demanded, be brought forth and classed in the cursed and cruel company of those who shall be dragged before the tribunal of Christ, with their fingers dyed, and dropping with the blood of those who are peculiarly dear to him? I know it will be said that in all these cases it would be a clear case of confession. Well, that's all I would have granted. For that which doth overbalance to a testimony, and that all the cases mentioned, is so far from being wanting in the cases now under consideration, that they have all to enforce the duty, that all of them put together do include, as will be clear to any who consider, number one, the preciousness of the things and interests to be destroyed. Number two, the concurrence called for from everyone that this desperate design may be accomplished. Third, the great manifold and indispensable obligations are uh, all are under, not only to abstain from the required concurrence, but to pre preserve also and maintain these things in opposition to all whom Satan sets on work, to serve him in his expedition against the Son of God, and to do it or endeavor it with the loss of life and all things dearest to men, to the end that these things, which are Satan's eyesore, as only obstructive of his kingdom, may be preserved among the poor remnant and propagate in their power and purity to the posterity. Happy he who shall be found so doing now, when the dragon and his angels are drawn into the fields, and have proclaimed the war and published to the world the causes thereof, so that now this general, having laid aside all his old disguises, doth in his true shape march upon the head of his black legions, who wear his badge and colors, and fight under his banner and standard. Third, in the last place, with all possible brevity, I shall offer some reasons against compliance with these exactions in cumulo. Number one, to pay these impositions upon such declared accounts for such declared causes and for such declared ends would condemn the contendings and sufferings of many eminently godly, especially in our day, who have refused them. Of these questions and sufferings thereupon, among the godly in former times, we cannot instruct m much for such insolent impositions as to all the dimensions of their heinousness were never heard before. But we want not examples of the saints refusing to give their money and other such things to wicked men either to comply with their wicked demands, obey their wicked laws, encourage their wicked courses, or further their wicked designs. In Scripture we find Paul would not give Felix money, that he might be loosed, though he sent for him often for that end. Acts 24, verse 26. Mr. Durham, in his exposition of the Revelation, in chapter 6, verse 9, lecture 6, gives an account, quote, that when in the persecution of Diocletian, the persecutors sought but the Bibles, poor coats, money, or cups, wherewith they served, to be given them, as some evidence of their seeding. But they refused to accept deliverance upon these terms. Yea, when the soldiers, partly wearying to be so bloody, partly desirous of seeming victory over Christians, did profess themselves content to take any old paper or clout in place of the Bible, they refused to give any ecvola, or castaway clout, Yea, when soldiers would violently pluck such things from them against their wills, they would follow them, professing their adherence unto the truth, and that they had not any way willingly delivered these things, as it is to be seen in Baronius, answer 302, page 748. It is reported of one Marcus Arethusius, who was put to torment under Julian, because he would not build the idle temple which he had formerly demolished, when they were content to accept some part of the expenses from him and to spare his life, he refused to give oblum, or one half penny, sozum, lib five, nine, cent mag cent four, page seven hundred 
and 97 and page 833. By which, in many other instances, we may see how resolutely the primitive saints held fast their testimonies, from which especially they were called martyrs or witness, or witnesses, excuse me, and by which often not only many weak ones were strengthened, but also many persecutors convinced and made to cry out, Certainly great is the God of the Christians. While as they saw that no allurements on the one side nor terrors on the other could make them loose their grips, but still truth and Christ were borne witness unto, and well spoken of by them. It will not be unnecessary here to consider some of Mr. Durham's observations on the fourth lecture, for clearing whereof he adduces these matters of fact, such as OBS 7, that the giving of a testimony by outward confession of the truth, when called for, is necessary and commendable, as well as soundness of faith. Yea, it is oftentimes the outward testifying of the truth before men, more than the faith of it before God, that bringeth on suffering. And there was nothing more abhorred in the primitive Christians than dissembling of a testimony to evite suffering, as appeareth in Augustine's writings concerning a lie and against a lie, and the writings of others to that purpose. That every truth of the word may be a ground of suffering warrantably, for the least thing that hath the truth in it, as well as the more concerning fundamental truths, is the word of God, and so cannot be dispensed with by his people. Every truth in the word hath an outward testimony joined to it, and sometimes may be called for upon very great hazards. When it is called for, this testimony or confession to any truth before men is no less necessary, and ought, to, and, and ought as preemptorily to be held and stuck to as the former. Therefore it is called, Romans 10. Confession unto salvation, and called for by a peremptory certification, Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33. That these who were sound in the faith of the word will be also exceedingly tenacious of their testimony in scripture, and in primitive times we will find the saints sticking at and hazarding themselves on things which appear of very small moment, yet were to them of great concernment because of the testimony which was involved in them, which they would not let go. Such was Mordecai in Esther 3, and Daniel in Daniel 6, in his not shutting of his windows. Yea, further, in his lately printed sermons on Matthew 16, verse 24, sermon 7, page 155, the same author saith, There is not in some respect a more and a less in the matter of duty, and in the matter of truth, or in a respect of suffering. And a little after, in section 5, he says, We would not limit sufferings for Christ to be things simply lawful or unlawful, for it may be sometimes for things indifferent in their own nature, which yet being so and so circumstantiated to us, may draw on suffering. A thing may be indifferent and lawful to some, which to others, stated under such and such circumstances, may be counted a receding from some part of a just testimony, even though the matter be not such in itself and in its own nature, yet it may be so circumstantial in so, uh, to some persons as it may be liable to that construction, if they shall recede from or forbear it, as in the example of David, who suffered for opening his windows, which was a thing indifferent in itself and not essential to his worshipping of God. But he finds himself bound on conscience, and that on very just ground, to do as he was wont to do before, and that on the manifest hazard of his life, lest his malicious enemies should have it to say that he receded from his duty, and that he thought more shame now, or was more afraid now than before, to worship the true God." Unquote. How worthy Mr. Knox argueth for withholding emoluments from the false bishops and clergy may be seen before Part 1, Per 3. The General Assembly in their declaration dated July 1648, concerning the then unlawful engagement in a war against England, plainly and positively behordeth all members of the Kirk of Scotland from contributing any assistance thereunto, expressed as followeth, quote, that they do not concur in nor any way assist this present engagement, as they would not partake in other men's sins and so receive of their plagues, but that by the grace and assistance of Christ they steadfastly resolve to suffer the rod of the wicked and the utmost which wicked men's malice can afflict them with, rather than to put forth their hands to iniquity, unquote. 
in which declaration may be seen at large that candor, faithfulness, and freedom, which becometh the ministers of the gospel, and dignity of watchmen in their seasonable warning, and dissuading all from assisting any way to that unlawful engagement, perceiving the sin and snare thereof, so obviously tending to the involvement to the involving, excuse me, the land in guilt and exposing to wrath. Yea, and that notwithstanding of the fair and plausible pretexts of the engagers and joiners therein, who pretended and professed their undertaking to be for the furthering reformation, establishing and securing the covenanted religion from the plottings and endeavors of the popish, prelatic, and malignant enemies thereof, and prosecuting the ends of the covenants, pretenses which no doubt our silent and time-serving ministers, if they had any such now to plead, would strenuously improve in vindication of their prudent silence, sinful, and shameful compliances.